Welcome to Gourmet Brewing. I'm your host, Doug Piper, and I want you to know how much I appreciate your allowing me to join you in growing our beverage skills together. I'm a certified Cicerone and a certified BJCP beer and mead judge, and I'm working on advanced ranks. And these webinars and the Facebook study groups are my way of sharing what I'm learning on my beverage journey. Now, I don't know about you, but I am really ready to get a haircut. This uh, COVID-19 haircut is getting old and I'm ready to move forward with whatever our new normal is. However, I'm not insensitive to those that may have actually lost friends or have suffering or loved ones during this crisis. So my prayers go out to those in difficult situations. And certainly our beer industry has been really hit hard like so many I would encourage you to continue to support your local breweries and, and homebrew shops and those folks. And meanwhile, I'll continue to do the live stream events as long as you'll keep showing up. Our most recent webinars have been with Lars Garsol, and he did one on Kvike Yeast Secrets, uh, Lindsay Barr on a tasting tech app, which we'll actually use today, Brian Kenny on Minimalist Brewing, and Peter Simons on fermentation controllers. Sierra Nevada did one uh, with Terrence Sullivan on barrel aging and some of their secrets there. Travis Rupp with Avery Brewing on their Ales of Antiquity series and Richard Priest on Kavaiki. So this will actually be our third in the series of uh, live streams on Kavaiki. Now, if you missed any of those, you can check them out in the previous programs most easily by clicking the follow button in the upper right hand corner of your screen. I'll also share an uh, email in the uh, after the live event. Now, I want to mention hitting that follow button actually is more important than I thought. I was talking to a major magazine who was interested in getting involved with their programs. And they were not impressed uh, with the number of uh, followers that I had. So that was kind of a problem. Uh, so I would encourage you there, if you can, uh, to uh, click on those links and, and follow if possible. All right. So one man show. So when I click, I don't always get everything just right. So. Today, uh, we've got Dwayne Schaff. He is a self-trained chef, sommelier, a brewer who owns the Celebrations Restaurant, Ebb and Flow fer Fermentations, and Kaleidoscope Coffee Roasters in Cape... Oh, you'll have to help me with that pronunciation. <laughs> Get, Cape Girardeau. Girardeau. What is it? Cape Girardeau. Gerardo. <laughs> I would say I hose that pretty good. <laughs> I've heard and worse around here. Chef of Celebrations Restaurant for over 20 years. He's gained a number of regional distinctions and helped build an award-winning wine list. In 2017, he started the Kavike World Order blog group and the Mud King Worldwide Experimental Yeast Products project, excuse me, uh, that where they shared yeast with 35 commercial breweries and over 250 home brewers in 47 countries and six continents. So I'll bet there's some folks on the program today that have received some of yours, Dwayne. It's definitely at, likely. At Ebb and Flow Fermentations, uh, Dwayne has started a series of beers called Folk Art. And he hopes these will commercially revive the countless nearly extinct beer styles from around the world with a collection of 23 original culture Kvikes at their disposal. Ebb and Flow uses Kvike in upwards of 90% of fermentations. I'm so impressed with that because I have looked high and low to find a brewery like this. So when not immersed in the world of food and beverage, uh, Dwayne loves annoying his family with foraging, African jazz, poverty, poverty food. <laughs> okay. And French philosophy. So welcome Dwayne to Gourmet Brewing. That might be the most uh, interesting intro <laughs> I've ever done. <laughs> oh, thanks Doug. Yeah. It's, um, I have a series of, uh, eclectic taste, but, uh, yeah, I think 
Today is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about uh, Kvike, both in classic styles, some modern Americans, not IPAs or sours, really, uh, but a lot of other experimental and um, culinary styles. Uh, also in that, we're going to talk about some can conditioning slash bottle conditioning. And then uh, kind of finish up with like uh, Britannomyces, um, Britannomyces integration. Perfect. Well, uh, I can't wait to hear more, but I want to take just a second. There may be some folks on, there usually are, that have never been on one of these programs before. And I want you to kind of know how this works. First of all, if your webinar is not playing correctly, and that's more common than I would like to think with the uh, stress on the internet that uh, COVID has, or our, our quarantine has caused, uh, just refresh your browser window. Most of the time that will fix it. Also, there's a gear symbol in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you click on that, you can reduce the resolution of your program and that might help you. Uh, at the bottom, one of the most important things, I think, is the Ask a Question button. We'd love for you to click on that. We also have a poll going. Uh, I'll mention kind of where we are on the polls, but this kind of helps us with not only this event, but fewer ones. We're trying to find out if you're brewing at home, are you brewing more often as a result of the COVID crisis? And right now, almost 68% say no. Uh, have you fermented with Kvike yeast before? Almost 60% say yes. Wow, that's an unusual group. Uh, have you attended a previous gourmet brewing live stream event? And almost 70% say yes. Uh, and for those of you, it looks like about 33% say no. So we're glad to have uh, those that have never joined us before. And in the question of what live streaming subjects are you most interested in, the two top ones, Dwayne, are Kvaik and discussions with popular homebrewing authors. So we'll continue moving forward with, with that. And actually, we've got a special announcement along that. Uh, over there in the chat, the only thing you can't do is really put questions there because we might overlook them. And we'll get to the questions in the second half of the program. Now, I also wanted to mention, I said that there were some Facebook groups and I want to put those over there in the chat. Uh, we have several Facebook groups that really kind of support these events. Uh, if you are interested, we'd love to have you join us uh, because this is part of uh, kind of what I'm doing. So the 101 and the 201 BJCP groups are for beer judging, if you're interested in that. The Mead and Cider is also for beer judging. And if you're interested in kind of just following what Gourmet Brewing is interested is doing overall, uh, the Gourmet Group will take you there. Uh, also, uh, these are all completely uh, crowdfunded. So if there's any way possible, and I know money is tight right now, but if you can support uh, through the, the Patreon giving or the donation button, uh, that helps offset these costs because they are direct and they are right here and they are real. <laughs> also, a easy way to get it is if you join through the AHA link, it gives a little bit of money to support what we're doing. Uh, so the BJCP has supported these a little bit and, and I appreciate that very much. And also, I've got a lot of good supporters and I thank you for making these programs available. So before we move into Dwayne's uh, program, I've got a little interesting experiment that I would like to do. So during Richard Priest's program, he told me, he said he put a flake of Kvike into a coffee cup of wort and it was fermenting when he returned from lunch. So we're going to try that. So right over here, I have got a small bottle of Kvike, uh, Kvike, excuse me, wart. I'll put that on the uh, side camera so you can see what we've got. So there's a little bit of water because I've got it sitting in a water bath and apparently I've got a little bit of sediment on the bottom from the DME. Uh, it is a 12 Plato wart and I have put it at about 100 degrees F. So we're going to then take 
some kvike yeast. Uh, here's our yeast. Uh, this came in from the folks at uh, Lalamond. And we're going to take this guy and open it up. And we're going to put it in there and we're going to see what happens. And so we'll find out real time uh, kind of what, what this is going to do. So let's take this guy and open it up. Let me find out where I am here on the overhead camera. All right. Let's see if we can get it so you can see what's going to happen. So I'm going to put in, oh, maybe about half a teaspoon, maybe. Not that much. You can see there's plenty left in the package. Only just a little bit of it was used. All right. So we'll put that guy up and I want you to see kind of what we got here. So I'm going to swirl this up so we can get a bit of it uh, dissolved. I've learned it has a tendency to float. And the reason you see a little bit of foam at the top is I aerated this thoroughly. So in putting it in, it, uh, I think, uh, left a little bit of foam. It looks like most of it has settled. And so I think this is looking pretty good. So I've got a bubbler here and I put a little bit of uh, colored water in it so we can see it and we'll see what this guy is looking like. So there's our yeast. Not much is happening now, but we will look through the course of the program uh, just so you can see the bubbler. Well, I can't really see the bubbler right there. I may have to adjust the camera a little bit later. But you can see it through this camera, I think, kind of where we are. And at least in my experiments, uh, this thing has been going in less than 30 minutes. So that will be a lot of fun. So, Dwayne, let's get you back on the program. And you might tell, tell everybody kind of where, where we are, where I am. If I could get this screen to change so we can bring you up. Well, I can't get it, so I'm going to try and bring you up full screen. Well, the internet has proved to be slow at the moment, so we might have to work from your corner until this thing decides to uh, change its mind. Oh, that's fine. It's just not letting me do it. So I tell you what, I'm going to refresh my screen, screen, which will make me disappear, but take you full screen, and I'll be back in just a second. Okay. I think I am. <laughs> the internet is not working well today. <laughs> oh, I love this. Anyway, Dwayne, you still there? I sure am. All right. I'm going to have to do it the hard way. Back in a second. Yes, I have appeared. Uh, I guess while we're waiting for Doug, uh, we weren't going to talk about this, but what I'm going to do is put, um, let's see, I don't know if you can see us. It's Lucy Lager. This is um, faux lager in my mind. It's from at a second shift in St. Louis. Uh, it is a Kvike fermented lager. 
uh, delicious. So I'm going to bring it up later. We'll talk about it. But uh, this is one of those things I figured right now I'll kind of gab about that. Um, to my knowledge, this is for Mitha with Oslo. Uh, that is a bootleg biology strain. They're at in Asheville, Tennessee. Jeff Mello owns that. Uh, and that's something, it's a very clean, clean uh, Kvike that does a great job at making faux lagers. And I know there's people out there that are going to say you can't do a lager without uh, the German strains, especially the German lagers. But this is something that will work for clean uh, fermentation and styles. Well, I was going to let you go ahead. <laughs> I was just kind of eating up a little time. But yeah, that's... It's, it's just a really clean fermenter and it does a great job as far as, especially if you're following your, your kind of your standard protocol for lagers, you want something dry, cre clean, crisp, and just uh, very sessionable in a lager style. Uh, the Oslo works very well. And I guess, Doug, do you want to go back to uh, commercial calibration? Uh, keep talking for just a second. Okay, Let me perfect. get one thing. I've got a technical issue to clear you up, and then we'll be good. Sounds great. Well, I guess what we're going to start doing, uh, really, if some of the things I want to touch on today were uh, some of my sakes, my uh, favorite Kvike, um, From Garden, Lita, Grand Vin. Those are some of my favorites as far as... Um, Full cultures. Uh, we deal with those origin cultures as opposed to some of the uh, isolates from the um, Omega or White Labs or Escarpment in Canada. So uh, our palate's a little different to paint with in the brewing, you know, the brewing world. And the uh, the styles that we're looking at today are going to be based around mostly English styles, some German nails, and then also, again, some of the Britannomyces and even into a, a wine and beer hybrid. I was looking down here on the questions. saw these earlier. So um, looks like Russell Gibson. He had uh, he had a question about fermenting Kvike um, for lagers at a hotter temperature. Temperature at what temperature? Uh, we do ours somewhere in like eighty five to ninety F. I've heard of other people fermenting them lower, but really ours we found if you get the right one, you can do it really clean, really nice fermentation, uh, crispness, but at those warmer temperatures, you really. To us, it's more about the uh, doing maybe a decoction, uh, having your water profile right, you know, using noble hops, maybe finishing with a little modern if you want. Well, that was not fun, <laughs> <laughs> but we roll. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think what we'd, I'd like to pick up on at this point, Dwayne, uh, is we move into our commercial calibration. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the, uh, join code was, uh, one of the questions I see there. And I actually, uh, put it in up here at the top. Uh, so the join code is what we're going to use to evaluate, uh, the, uh, Mordura beer from Cigar City. And I'm going to bring that up. My gosh, the internet is not <laughs> working well with me today. There we go. All right. We're getting there, folks. I apologize. So we're going to be using the Sample Ox app. Uh, you can download it from Android or you can download it from Apple. Uh, it's free. And this is what we're going to be using together. And I'm trying to find that code. OK, here it is. So the code is, I'll call it out, but I'll also post it in the chat. It is W R a whiskey, Roger, uh, Kvike, Roger Kvike. And I will post that in the chat. There we go. 
exactly what we thought we did. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Something worked right. <laughs> All right. So I would say we move into that. Uh, by the way, and just before we look, uh, we'll go to the uh, side camera right quick and see what kind of action we got here on our yeast. And get in here, focus here. So we're getting a little, little foaming action. Oh, uh, but uh, no, no bubbling yet. So let's move into our beer. I'm going to grab mine. So while I pour this, uh, Dwayne, you might want to walk in, walk everybody through it a little bit, and then I will bring up the sample ox app. Sure. All right. So we're doing the Maduro Brown Ale from Cigar City out of Tampa. Um, basically on the back, it says named after a dark cigar wrapper, Maduro Brown Ale boasts notes of semi-sweet chocolate, toffee, and hints of fresh coffee. Complex and full-bodied, our malt floor ale is brewed with flaked oats to add depth of character. And it is 5.5% 5, 5 and 20 IBUs. And I tell you what, I actually hadn't had this until earlier this week. Uh, we just got them in the state not long ago, and I've always heard how good it was, and it pretty much delivers. It's a nice, you know, it's on a darker spectrum from, in my mind for the brown, but it's got a beautiful complexity in the nose, nice chocolate, got that toffee, a little coffee. I actually get a little, like a little leather, maybe even cigar wrap. Maybe it's just uh, the uh, alliteration coming in, but uh, it's a beautiful beer. Yeah, it really is. Someone's right. asking, this is canned on the 28th of January. That's uh, Joseph Hertz. Oh, hey, Joseph. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to bring up here on the app and start to put in my notes. So let's see. Sample ox. There we go. And I actually have already put in the join code. So I'm actually a big fan of dark beers. And I like this one, I would say moderately. Uh, it's probably not my favorite, but I, but I like it at least. Uh, it, it's, it's a very nice one without a doubt. Uh, Color-wise, ooh, it's pretty dark, dark. I would put this guy... Which darn darn close to black, kind of a dark brown maybe. Uh, and then aromas. Um, what do you get? I get a little bit of kind of earthiness. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'm not finding earthy, but I've seen it. Got to spell it. So where's the backup key? Let's put that down there. Earthy. There we go. Okay. So that gets set. Um, certainly, you know, you get a little bit of, I think I get some graham cracker, certainly some biscuit, certainly some toast. Um, I don't get much roast. Do you? Not right? a lot. More, more yeah. like a toffee kind of a sweet sugar as opposed to like a to like a roasted starch. Yeah, so I that goes in the sweet aromatic. So I get uh, maybe a tiny bit of caramel, definitely some toffee, um, maybe a touch of molasses. It looks a little sweet with a little tiny little bit of vanilla. And I would say that's about it. Um, and in the sweetness, it's not really, it's maybe low, certainly not salty, certainly not sour, certainly not, well, I guess it's a low bitterness. Body's probably medium, carbonation, medium, alcohol, 
is medium drying, kind of low, spicy, I'd say it's low. What do you think, Dwayne? Anything you do any different? No, I think that's good. I might add a hint of burnt sugar, but that'd be about it. And All right. through some of the Keptenis brewing, I get a lot of the same notes in this. Well, we'll give everybody a few minutes uh, to enter in their numbers, and then we'll go and uh, kind of see how everybody's doing and see, uh, see where their score is. And I see somebody asking about the app. It is Sample Ox and just type in the join code WRKRK. That's Whiskey Roger Kavike, Roger Kavike. And then you can put in your, your info. So Dwayne, I think that's uh, kind of it on the tasting. Uh, we'll bring up the report in just a little while, but let's, I would say, get into uh, our program. Perfect. Well, we kind of started a while ago uh, during the technical difficulties uh, about some of my favorites. Uh, and I guess that's probably the best way. It's how we lined up the program. But like, if you look at Kavike as a family, you have all the wild, like original cultures. And then you have the isolates, literally yeast that are pulled out of those. Those are the ones that are most commonly available. Um, you also have the potential through maniacal yeast labs. Uh, they have some of the original cultures that's bacteria, everything in them. Uh, they, for the most part, came through me, uh, through Svein and in um, Norway. But uh, he does them on a limited basis, and they're they're those original cultures. So you can get some. I think he's done from Garden Lita and Granvin, and he gives uh, both liquid and dry versions of those. Um, part of the reason why I like from Garden so much is versatility. It uh, has the capability to do uh, light, dark. It's someone recently said it was essentially like, uh, what is it, 1968? That's uh, Fuller's. So it's like a Fuller's almost on steroids. You get a similar ester profile. It ferments very clean, very well, leaves a nice body to it. Uh, versatile. Uh, after that, Lita is another of my favorites, mostly because of just the the beautiful expression in the aromatics. Uh, it has to me really cool, almost like a rose, like a rose wine profile, soft, subtle, uh, crushed berries. But I've had others, and I think this is due to its horn and background, uh, have more caramely notes. Uh, and then probably my last favorite is Grand Ven. Uh, it is one that the full culture originally has Pitya, uh, wild yeast or a, a wild wine yeast. And it has a very, very tropical kind of profile. If you do that with um, basically no hops, like a no hop or a rye ale, uh, you can get a very cool, like almost mango papaya sour uh, if you're fermenting it by itself like, like that. So basically pitch, maybe make a 5% wort, pitch that in at 100, try to hold its temp. And in like five days, you'll end up with a very clean, sour, but just massive fruit from the PGA and the bacteria. So Dwayne, I thought since this thing has already started bubbling, mm -hmm. which is at, frankly is the fastest I've ever <laughs> seen it do. Uh, I thought I'd take the overhead camera and let everybody see what this guy's looking like uh, down in the container. There we go. So that'll give you a little bit of an idea of what this guy is already doing. Uh, now, and, and I didn't really do anything all that special. I did thoroughly aerate it. Um, it's at about 100 degrees F. I did put some, some yeast nutrient, just a tiny little bit of yeast nutrient, and it's a 12 Plato wart. So as you can see, this guy is already going uh, pretty darn well uh, in just a few minutes. I guess it's been about 10 minutes since we've been going and was already generating some action here. So I'm going to take this probably and put it back over here uh, where I've got a water bath where we can keep it about 100 degrees. It's, it's truly amazing how fast they work. <laughs> 
And and that's one of those funny things is you're talking about oxygen and nutrients. Uh, they, especially if they're not a raw ale, they like nutrients. Uh, so once you get going, unless you're doing, especially if you're doing on the lower end of the pitch, like you'll hear people, and I think there was a question about under pick, under pitching. And that's one of the things, if you under pitch, I would highly recommend oxygen and a probably a double dose of nutrient. Yeah, for you looking through who that was. Um, but yeah, the nutrient is something that we don't use a lot of, but we also do a lot of raw ales. So that has all the nutrient in it. Um, I was going to look here. That is phenomenal. We'll, we'll it's let, ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'll let you continue, but I'm so thrilled. <laughs> this could have been rough. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, right. uh, the kind of the next part I wanted to talk over was essentially, you know, I said something about unique processes and procedures for Kavike. Uh, we do mostly barrel and from fermentation at the brewery. Uh, we literally inoculate barrels. And so we'll have like our mid bust barrel, a from garden barrel, and we get our Kavike set up like that. And we pitch in once we low pitch once, and then we essentially turn them over dump and refill. Uh, and it's funny we've had some that that literally take off in span of maybe an hour maybe hour and a half and they're just the whole thing like a two barrel volume just ripping and done in two or three days i think my uh my brewer brandon said that the fastest was about a day and a half and that went from basically 12 plato to whatever terminal was on that batch i forget at this moment but they're very quick fermenting especially if they're healthy um, they have plenty of nutrient, plenty of oxygen and temperature, which is part of the reason why we did the oak. Uh, it's a thermal insulator, so you can ferment the whole thing and you don't have to worry about thermal loss, which is we were running into with the uh, steel. Uh, that's We don't have any uh, like temperature control. We don't have glycol. We don't have anything. We're trying to do styles as they were often like 100, 200 years ago. So we're trying to emulate those uh, different styles and different techniques. Uh, so in that line, you know, I had barrel fermentation and inoculation. Uh, we would for a, say a, a oak barrel, it would be like a 375 mil starter and that would get ripping pretty quick. Uh, then after that, again, it essentially inoculates into the wood and you'll hear about the Kavike rings or the Kavike logs we just treat the barrel as that. And so we don't worry about repitching. We just go and just, we have to stagger our brews to where they're going on top of it after we're pulling out the beer ahead of it and, and rinsing, I say rinse, uh, just emptying and, and getting ready to reuse again. The residual takes care of it and it's about a perfect pitch rate is what we found. Did I see Doug, you pulled out the Kentucky Common? Well, I thought it might be a, a good time. Uh, you, you'd you indicated you thought that kind of worked into their presentation nicely. Yeah. And especially that that wasn't actually a barrel fermented. This was done in a small batch, just like a pilot. Uh, we were working these up to go over to Amsterdam for the Britannomyces Carnival, and it was canceled due to COVID, so we decided to release them. So that's... Uh, done with all malts from Caleb up at Sugar Creek in Indiana. And that is, let me pull my recipe here. That is their pale ale, their bloody butcher corn malt. So the, it's an heirloom strain of malt or sorry, of corn that was malted. And then their caramel corn, which is a malted corn that then they go through the caramel process on. And then that was done with mitt bust. Uh, which I think is great for German style lagers. So kind of in the steam beer feel, that's why we went with that. And I believe, where did that finish? Is it, did we put the alcohol on that label? That was one of our, uh, our quick sins. We didn't finish them all out. I don't think, I think that's what five, yeah. five. Yep. Four, four point seven. Four seven. On that. Okay. Yep. But yeah, I think that pours really well. And I think that's what these, Kavai can be done and used for really well are the kind of classic styles. Uh, a lot of people do IPAs and I'm probably going to get <laughs> hate mail. I don't care for them and IPAs all that much. I think the hot profiles, uh, the bitterness especially can be a little wonky. 
So I tend to go 18 to 30 IBU. I don't use a ton of hop. I'll, most of our stuff is done with a lot of uh, European nobles or, or even like classic Amer as far as like uh, Cascade or Willamette. That's because I think this was Styrian Golding. But, you know, that's, those are the styles that we're trying to do. And uh, I really think that styles like Kolsch, Common, uh, head down here, like for the German lagers or, or German ales, I'm sorry. We did uh, Mitbust and Lita, and we've really started on Ebba Garden. Uh, they're all cleaner, but they have a nice uh, fruity, kind of a stone fruit ester that I think is very indicative of the German uh, ale styles. Um, another, I think I talked earlier, the faux lagers, I think Ebba Garden and Scara, which is, if someone can correct me, but I think Oslo from bootleg biology they're using scar it's a scar isolate so there's a lot of fun to go into those cleaner german styles with different kabike you probably get the caramel corn a lot that it, it, that malt was kind of crazy yeah that is you know i expected a little bit of fruitiness now this was fermented with kabike yes mitt bust mitt bust at 100 so degrees it? yeah Pardon? it's a it's a you know, it's not particularly fruity uh, or orangey or any the of those orange things is mostly you... around Voss. Okay. Yeah. The, so S Sigmund Yernus, Nornus, um, I forget some of the others, but the Voss strains especially have that really citrus note. Uh, Mitbus, like I said, it's, I think there's a subtle stone fruit, but as a whole, it's a really clean fermenter. Like I said, 100 degrees, it's, you threw an American ale on there, it would be a mess. <laughs> yes, it is. It's really nice. It's it's very dry. Um, maybe just a just a tad of sweetness. Uh, goes down, boy. It's a great lawnmower beer. Yeah, that's the day. that's the point on that. <laughs> <laughs> it would be awesome, but it's got some nice body to it. Uh, that I like the caramel. Uh, it's not too rich. It's just kind of a touch of caramel. So it's. It's kind of like, oh, I hate to say a, a super light Doppelbach because that's not even fair. Um, it's like a, Go it's ahead. like a touch, a touch of a Doppelbach <laughs> in a longboard beer. And I think that's that that caramel corn. Yeah, uh, it's it's fun, but theoretically, that's supposed to be a dark cream ale. Is kind of what they explain it as, and I think it's got a little more body than a cream would have, but I think it shows up oh, real yeah. well. Yeah. Um. I'm impressed. So this is a hundred percent Kvike ferment, fermented. Yes. And how long did it take? Do you know roughly? Mm, I think it was about week and a half. Some of it probably done before then we let it go a little longer cause we don't have glycol. So we have to let it finish, finish. Okay. There's a lot of people that'll get it done in four days or three days and then they'll, you know, they'll crash it. But since ours is just all ambient, we have to do our structure a little differently. So Joseph says Kentucky Common has no stone fruit historically, and certainly this has no stone fruit. Cool. I'm glad it's like that. Now, it's not a, I, I was reading historically, it had a very subtle fruitiness, I think is what BJCP said. Well, this is well done, and it's done with Kavik. So certainly proves uh, that some classic styles can be done that way. Perfect. Well, I'll let you continue on and I'll quit interrupting. I might go get out our uh, yeast and see how it's coming while you're talking. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Well, after the uh, the faux lagers and the German ales, a lot of people have asking about English styles. Uh, to me, the go-to is from Garden. After that, Ebba Garden's versatile because it'll also do that. If you go a little, <laughs> it's funny how quick that's going. Isn't that uh, unreal? But yeah, the Ebba Garden, I think, does well because if you if you minimize the the temperature a touch, it'll actually push, in our opinion, uh, a little more, a little softer fruit with the high temp. You'll go really, really fruit forward. And then it depends on how your malt profile is. That's amazing how fast that goes. I haven't Isn't played it? with the dried at all. Well, 
I, I did practice a few times, uh, mm -hmm. and this is the fastest by far, so I'm thrilled now that I'm on camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you you can see it's uh it's built up a pretty pretty big head and there's a lot of really large uh, bubbles in it. And so does it on the pack? Does it say that's for five gallons? It is. Yes, it's a sachet for five gallons. Okay, and the reason why I was saying with that, my guess, like you could even get a similar result probably with. I don't know, a tenth of a teaspoon. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, Voss is a very active fermenter too. Some of them will be a little slower, but Voss is a very active, and I'm pretty certain that's what that is. Uh, I was going to finish up style recommendations. Uh, darker beers. Uh, but From Garden is one we really enjoy, and then another of the Voss. Uh, Nornis is probably our two favorites for dark. Uh, Justin at Maniacal, he said he prefers Lita, Scara, and then Tomasgard which I enjoy personally for some of our culinary styles. I think it has um, kind of a cool savory note and that along with Lita and Enornis again are our kind of uh, the culinary is like our beet beers or we've done some with garam marsala and a number of other ingredients that you're, you're wanting a dry crisp finish. Uh, and I think that those kind of the aromatic profiles that they have really play well with it. And I think you were asking before, Doug, about the culinary styles, weren't you? I was. Yeah, so uh, we talked about a beet beer. Uh, and I think beets, oddly enough, play really well with some of the Kvike. Um, we've had really good luck with some gruets. So if you're looking for something you can forget, ferment hot, uh, especially in the summer, say you forage, and you want to ferment that and say you want to get a little sourness, don't add any hops. So traditional gruit, if you want a uh, touch of hops, something to mute the uh, acidity of the original cultures that, that usually have bacteria. And you can check all these uh, Lars who was on the, on, on the uh, webinar before, his Kvike registry has what the original cultures, whether they're bacteria or non. So it's you can, kind of a good de database to look into. I was looking to see what else was people were asking. Looks like Jimmy was asking, are lab isolated Kvike yeast easier to get a repeatable grasp on a flavor profile than original mixed cultures when you plan to harvest and reuse your yeast? I would say yes. <laughs> they uh, Having one yeast versus... Uh, just a grouping of different yeast and bacteria, if it's in there. Uh, they're, they're still, I think they're adapting to the US and if you're in another country, to those countries, uh, a lot of these have only been brewed and maybe are used in one spot in the world and they've adapted to that climate. They've probably adapted to the air around them, to their malt, to their water. So we're moving them into a different spot and I have a feeling those original cultures are acclimating right now. Uh, I was going to see. Then Franco says, do you pitch a regular pitch rate for Kvike? If not, which rate ever had under pitch issues? Um, we under pitch quite a bit. So if we do a seven barrel batch, we typically pitch about a two liter starter. So that's what, 200 and some odd gallons, um, two liters. And it's usually ripping the next morning that we're noticing, uh, so we haven't really had much issue, but again, we either do royals or, or have pitched some form of nutrient. And I think they work out really well like that. And different ones are more aggressive than others. And I see Drigo was asking about my Kv favorite Kvite culture. And like I, said, I think my favorite might just be from garden due to versatility. Um, Phil, I'm sorry. I'm, not the best at NEPA, though uh, at, or at Maniacal, he has a, I think he maybe actually has two uh, different strains built for NEPA specifically. And Justin brews a lot of them, so he knows exactly what he's talking about on those. And then I'll do one more. Ernie, I want to dehydrate my Kvike after I recover Kvike yeast from my fermenter. 
Should I worry about having trub with the dehydrated yeast? Uh, yes. What on the top cropping one, which again, it says uh, one way or the other on Lars's uh, Kvike registry. If you top crop, you probably don't have to do much. If you bottom, I would go ahead and do a yeast wrench maybe two or three times, try to get the trub out. Your viability is going to be higher. I have a feeling that the particulates in the in the slurry will um, minimize the survival and the viability of the kvike that's harvested. So I'm going to close that up. Yeah. So before we get through too many of the questions, uh, because we want to kind of go through those methodically if we can. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of your contact uh, content, Dwayne, do we want to, are there any more beers you wanted to open before we move into really getting through all the questions? How would well, you that's like? That's kind of uh, getting ready to start the Britannomyces. Do you have the Shiner can? I do. All right. So what you're calling the Shiner is the the label this can, correct? Yeah, the labels didn't come in in time. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, I will switch just to, uh, well, not not a lot of change on the Kavaiki, so we'll set that aside. And let's see. We, we wanted to use the uh, tulip for that one. So I'll get that ready and pour that while you're talking about it. Perfect. So... This is what started out as a Munich lager style base. Uh, then we completely turned it upside down. Uh, fermented it with a mixture of from garden and mid bust in a barrel. So it was a third use whiskey barrel. Fermented it with that. Then we pitched uh, again from Maniacal. It's their uh, hurricane bread blend. So it's got like a hundred different bread in it. Uh, let that age in the barrel. And that was four and a half months. And then we rack that into our bright tank that doesn't have temp control. So it's not really a bright, but uh, it's our fruiting tank. And we added raspberry, blackberry, blueberry, and choke cherries. And so that's part of the, I wanted this to pop up because I think that Brett actually has a lot of potential, or I'm sorry, Kvaik has potential with Brett. I think that the ester profiles that pop up in there really complement a lot of Brett and they fruit well. They are, I don't know, they're just, they're fun because you can do so many things with them. They work in a barrel. So we literally just uh, play with our pitching rate on these now. So we might go 70 or 75 F uh, to pitch. So that way the Brett phenolics don't jump up too high. And we try to get a round profile and let them ferment out. Like now they're co-pitched in, in uh, the newer versions of that beer. So Aaron says beautiful color. And I agree. Yeah. That's the choke cherries. <laughs> there was quite a few of them. And those actually, uh, my friend Josh up in Wisconsin brought those down. Yeah. There's a, I see Joseph down there again. There's a hint of vanilla. The, the fact that it's a third use, I think the vanilla is mostly tamed out. I, I like neutral oak more than aggressive or a, even bourbon -y style. I'm like four generations is about where my sweet spot personally. Uh, and the other reason why I wanted to bring that up. So we do can conditioning. So all the packages you get, we don't force carb and then fill. We don't do bottling lines. These are all essentially hand bottles. And they're all done keg condition or bottle condition or can condition. And so that's my recommendation with Kvike. We found a lot of variability whenever you're playing with them uh, as far as conditioning. And so I'd recommend the Bob Sylvester method. Uh, you can find that on Milk the Funk uh, on their wiki. And uh, it's basically champagne yeast. And you do a certain protocol. And it, I mean, it's perfect. It works pretty much every time. It's beautiful. It's, it's nice and, and, and it's so smooth. I, I really expected something a little more aggressive, uh, but it's a very pleasant fruitiness. Uh, goes down, boy, you could, what, what's the ABV on that? Uh, I, that would eight. be easy to drink. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, and what is it? It's six, eight. 
six a yeah. <laughs> that's deceiving <laughs> yeah but I, part of what i'm going for is is balance and nuance more than anything it comes to my culinary background so yeah. even with fruiting or anything else we don't try to go really big in any direction aside from just a big amount to drink i i love the act of drinking the act of uh just meeting and chatting with people and having a drink over it. And so that's where our profile at the brewery goes to. Our sours aren't too sour. Our hoppies aren't overly hoppy. Our our fruits, I think, are balanced. And that's where we kind of go with those. And that's why Kvike works well. It, it allows us to kind of, I think it, tie, it's, it ties everything together very well. And and some nice lacing. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I mean, that's that's only three weeks in can. It's three, three, three and a half. Weeks. It is yeah. so smooth. Thank you. The nice Very thing, nice. With, nice thing with Doug's or with uh, Bob's method too is that as a whole, there's so there's with dealing with the Britannomyces, you would have THP issue, and you don't really have to worry about the issues much. Uh, when we started using that, where we had it a touch before, even young, we haven't had any problems with it. I see Joseph mentions he does the same thing with barrels. Now you fermented this in a barrel, right? You just yes. did your your the the uh, carbonation in the can, right? Correct. Yeah, I'd so, say what is it? Probably seventy-five to eighty percent of our fermentation is in barrel now. Wow. And sometimes we might ferment in one barrel and rack into a newer barrel if we want to profile. You know, maybe two. Uh, barrels will go into one, fill that, and then we'll keg up uh, an un, like an unwhiskey barreled version of something if we want a whiskey profile on something. Because the okay. barrel fermentation actually takes a little bit of that whiskey profile out. Yeah, I really don't get much bar barrel characteristic in it. I, I wouldn't have known it was yeah, in there's a barrel. A little, there's a little tannin. Some of it's from the choke berry or choke cherries. Some of it's from that. Okay, well... It is very nice. Well, thank Nicely you. Nicely done. Thank you. And, and I didn't know, do you want to do the, do you want to just show the piquette, the red wine? That was the last note I was going to show, or if you just want to show the bottle. Uh, another. No, I think, you know, I've, I've struggled so to get Kvike fermented commercial beers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we need to go through this to, to show people how phenomenally good these things are and, and that it can be done. Yeah, I think there's just so much versatility to them. You know, I've done in the past some Saison fermented wines whenever, like at home. And uh, I think one of the fun things with Kvike is that we're starting to do the similar thing uh, with wine hybrids. So as a commercial brewery without a winery license, we can do 51% malt, 49% fruit or wine or whatever. So that Einklein Paquette, we did 49% fermentables of mm -hmm. local Chamberson grapes, basically pressed them, you know, destemmed them, pressed them, put them into our tank. Uh, then we poured a blonde word over it and fermented it with the wild yeast that were on the grapes and then Nornis Kvike. And that's where we kind of went with that. I'm, I'm a natural wine junkie. So allowing those natural wines the from the wine grapes and the Nornis to pair together, the progression as it, as the Nornis basically fell off of fermentation and the extra little oomph from that, um, from the wine isolates, or uh, they're not isolates, the wine yeast, uh, let them play. And it's still, it's to me, very clean. You get uh, a little strawberry to me, a little, it's almost rosé. Depends on if you pour this warm, you get more of like a sparkling uh, rosé wine profile. Whenever you drink it cold, the sourness, because there's a little pH drop, uh, the sourness comes out. It almost drinks more like a sour beer when it's cold. So it's a, it's a fun one that you can kind of play away, uh, play around with the different styles just by the drinking temp. Are you ready for me to open it? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So like I said, this was 49% Chamberson grapes from about, an, about 40 minutes north of here in Perryville, Missouri. And then the uh, remainder, it was just a Pilsner, Pilsner base, very simple. Um, I think we did like 10 IBUs, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the color on that's we've always been happy with. 
And this, I lied to you actually. This is the second used fruit. The first one's still in barrel. So this was actually the skins and pips from the first juice, and we racked a blonde on top of it. That is gorgeous. That is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, so we were, uh, Paquette is a wine style, basically it's second use fruit. In wine, traditionally, they would just add water, maybe a touch of sugar, and it's something that the you know, the harvest workers or someone would use this because it's lower alcohol. So we have this large wine beer hybrid that's in barrel and we wanted to use those grape skins and I'm all about conservation and using everything. So we poured another word on top of it and went like that. And it's, it's amazing that that was about, I think it was nine days on skins. And then we racked off and just let it chill out for about another three, four weeks. And then we bottled it and kegged it. And I, I think it's turned out really pretty. It's, it's a very different beverage. So it's it literally in that, in between like wine and beer. It's very wine-like. And that's oh. probably 80% beer. You know, if you're going on fermentables, that's kind of how we gauged it and the math turned out right. You know, I expected the pH to be lower. Yeah, um, it's like three, five, I think. It, 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 the aromas coming off of it, I would have expected it to be very sharp, but it's really not. I mean, it is, again, I love how balanced uh, your beers are because Thank none you. of them are just over the top. They're, 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 they, they are what you say and they are subtle enough um, that, that you could easily enjoy several of them. Yeah, uh, that's the, like I said, that's the plan. And for me, that's basically my charcuterie and cheese beer slash wine. Well, it's delicious and just, it's nice and dry, but, but again, just balanced. Well, in the wild yeast or why that's so dry. So that basically finished it. I mean, zero. Well, phenomenal beer. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to play around with more uh, beer wine hybrids. And it's something that I think that a lot of people should play with, with Kavai, because I think the potentials, I mean, it's just right there. You can ferment them warm. You can do them a little cooler. It takes, it just takes a lot of different things and it works well. So which uh, Kavai yeast did you use in this one, in the Piquet? Nornis. So Nornis. that's one of the boss. Okay. Well, that's phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, do you want to move to the questions at this point, Dwayne? Or what's? Or do you have a wrap up on kind of your uh, brewing classic styles with uh, Kavai? Uh, I mean, as a whole, I guess for wrapping up, I would recommend. I know a lot of people out there are doing IPAs and hoppy styles, and that's great. I know people love them. But I think to give Kavike a fair shake, because I've heard a lot of people out there that are like, it's not good for this, not good for that. And they've had off flavors. I really think a lot of the interactions with hops is where those off flavors are coming from. Uh, play around with, you know, 60 minute additions, get your bitterness, let the aromatics of the ester profiles come through, play around with a full kosh or a simple blonde, something play with what the yeast is before you cover up and try these older styles. Uh, I'm wanting to do a cup booster. Uh, we did a Schups, uh, basically like a six and a half percent German uh, wheat ale. And that was really fun. Play around with some of those. Uh, Lars new book came out. There's tons of older styles that they go with that are in his style. And there's, like I said, just a lot of these older styles that I think that Kavike is best utilized in. All right. Thank you, All Harry. Right. But I think, yeah, that's it for the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll see what our activity is looking like. Now that's, that's pretty good. I think it's been in all, been there all of 50 minutes. It nets, like you said, it's 12 Play-Doh? 12 Play-Doh. And I know uh, my buddy Chris down at Little Animals in uh, Tennessee, he said he's had some problems with some of the lower ABV. 
and I know a lot of the Kavike were basically brought up on a high, high ABV beers or work. Uh, so that may be part of it. I mean, our higher gravity ones tend to rip really, really fast. So I think it likes the amount of sugar that's in the larger ones. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is going to town <laughs> in, in 50 minutes. Uh, and the one I experimented with yesterday, it was pretty much had, had stopped uh, any airlock activity in probably 12 hours. That's crazy. I mean, it's probably uh, what, 200 mils? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. You could probably pitch that into a two barrel batch. <laughs> into a what? A two barrel batch. <laughs> I guarantee you. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Well, that is that is a heck of a demo. We'll come back because we're gonna move into the questions and uh we'll we'll come back to that. Well, let's move into those questions. Um and I know you've touched on some of them. And so just give a quick answer if you've already touched on some of them, Dwayne. Uh, sure. and, and also let me mention for, you know, we, we try and keep the programs to about an hour for the main content and then the second half questions. So we, we understand that's a lot to even commit an hour. So if you need to go, you know, go for it because all the questions, everything here is recorded. And if you've actually asked a question, you'll get a unique link that actually takes you to where the answer is in the recording. And you don't even have to listen to any of me. <laughs> so, uh, and if you need to ask a question right quick and run, you can submit yours and go. You will answer them whether you're here live or not. And the last thing is everybody gets one vote. So if you want to push one to the top in a hurry, go vote a, an existing question and push it to the top because we've got two dozen questions and it may take a little while. So uh, Russell has our most popular question by far. And he says for lagers, which is the best Kvike and it, and fermentation at what temperature? All right. So, <clears throat> so most of the commercial faux lagers, which is what I call a lager fermented with kvike, are done, to my knowledge, with Oslo from Bootleg. That's a Scara isolate. And this is actually one fermented of it. This is, again, the... Oh, it's flip. Oh. Lucy lager. And that's from Second Shift. I got one of yeah, those. Perfect. Yeah. So that's... Uh, I'm pretty certain that's Oslo. I reached out to Libby and Steve and I know they've been busy up there and uh, it is because I was concerned. I'd heard it was done with Kvike and they confirmed it is a Kvike fermented lager and I just don't know which one, but I'm pretty certain it's Oslo. It smells like Oslo. But look at the head on that guy. Oh yeah. Well, it's been, it's been warming. This is about where I like mine. Even so it's a gorgeous head. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a beautiful beer. I think um, it's got a nice kind of like fruity hot presence. I'm, I'd be curious what they finished it with. So so the short answer to the question, I think I got got, got distracted. The short oh, answer was Oslo. Oslo, and at what temperature? Um, we do ours warmer. I've heard mixed. I think if you do something like 70F, it might take longer. If you go 90, you're probably going to get a little more ester. Uh, that honestly, though, if you cold condition, a lot of that will fall out during your lagering. So I think you could do either or, but Oslo is really good. Uh, Scara is one that you can get if you can get the full culture. And then we use Ebba Garden um, a lot on ours. And that's another one of those that it has... It has more fruit when it's young, but once it goes through that yagering, lagering phase, it uh, it loses some of that, and it's very crisp and clean. Okay. And and just out of curiosity, since we're experimenting with Voss today, why would you not go with Voss? I think just the citrus profile, you know, because okay. that's one of the things as you get that citrus, Christmas spice, the, those Voss area, Kvike, I think all kind of have that. You know, if you go back and read a lot of those, like, so say Sigmund, his went bad, which I'm not saying it did, but if his went bad, he would go to his neighbor and he might mix his neighbors in with his, 
which is why you might get like 10 or 12 different yeast in one. They, okay. they were commingling. So villages ended up with distinct, uh, like a distinct profile of its own. Like Stortle up north is more stone fruit. Voss is more citrus. And it seems like it's a geographical flavor profiles. So since Russell had the most uh, popular question by far, anything else we should know about for lagers and fermenting temperatures, any other tips? Because a lot of people interested in that one. I mean, honestly, to me, it's more about um, water profile, the grains you're using, the hops. Like, do don't cheat on the lager part of it. Like, as far as the rest of the recipe, get your specific kvike that you're going to play with, like whether it be Oslo, which is probably what I would start with if you can get it. And then go with that and just try to make sure your recipe is done up for the most classic version. And I think that it plays really well with those styles, but it, a lot of those yeasts really are transparent. As you can see, there's, even though they have big, like big fruit esters when they're young, they still kind of come around and are really clean eventually. Like n neither of, probably none of the beers you had today were over the top. Yeah. So no, that, that's no. the thing is like, what? Very pleasant. No, yeah. they. I, I was agreeing with you. I'm sorry. That sounded <laughs> disagreeing, but it, no. it was meant to be agreeable. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really think that's the thing is like so many of these are really clean. So it's fun and it's nice to just kind of go with that classic recipe and let the beer be that. So start with that classic recipe. Make sure you're doing maybe a decoction or uh, do an extended boil, maybe like a 90 to 120 minute boil try to get those old school techniques and then play the first batch with the Oslo, do it hot. Maybe if it's a little fruitier, pull it back to 70 for a second batch. Good. And I put our, our experiment over there back into the water bath. So, so we won't compromise. I did learn the hard way that it does slow it down if mm -hmm. you leave it out too long and it cools off. So, uh, our next most, and by the way, that was a, a great question uh, that Russell asked. Next one is by Franco, and he has the next most popular question. Do you pitch a regular pitch rate for Kvikes? If not, which rate? And have you ever had under pitch issues? And I kind of touched on this earlier. We typically under pitch quite a bit. Uh, some labs will say to fully pitch, which I don't think is technically incorrect. I think maybe go with a regular pitch rate your first time. The, then move on past that, maybe decrease to a certain degree, maybe half it. And then the next batch, half it. We're down to where we're doing very little. I mean, we're, we'll harvest and for, you know, if we're doing a little 15 gallon pilot, we might add two teaspoons of slurry but that's pure slurry. So, I mean, you can go very low. We've rarely had issues with under, like under pitching, but we've had temp issues and we've, I can't say we've had over pitch issues though. I, I don't, you know, one batch we pitched really quick into a barrel and there was a lot of yeast in there, clean as could be. So, I mean, I don't think that the pitch rate, once you get to us, you know, obviously not too, too low, but once you get above that, I think it's not as important as just making sure your temp's consistent. You have plenty of oxygen. You have plenty of nutrient. And and since the temperature is more hot, are you talking about temperature issues being it got too hot or it cooled off? Cooled off. Cooled off. Yeah, okay. I've, I've accidentally gotten it up to about 120. And it still would ferment out. It just, I don't think it would have... I don't think it would have replicated from, from what I'm told by some of my, my microbiology buddies, the yeast that was there did the job that was done, but it wasn't going to reproduce. I got you. It was spent. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's such a forgiving yeast. Yeah. All right, Franco. Good question. Uh, looks like our next one is from Jimmy. Jimmy says, are lab isolated Kvike yeast easier to get a repeatable grasp on a flavor profile than the original mix cultures when you plan to harvest and reuse your yeast. Yeah, I do think it is easier, you know, because you're dealing with one thing. I mean, imagine you put a hundred people into a room versus a room with one person. You walk into the one and you ask their opinion. You're going to get the same time every time. 
you walk into the room of 100, you're going to get 100 different opinions. And then if they talk, that you know those opinions may be swayed, so you're getting different. So I think there's so many microbes going on in the uh, in the original cultures that I think that it's definitely easier to get a repeatable, consistent, re you know, uh, result from the lab isolates. All right, good question, Jimmy. Uh, Rodrigo has our next most popular. What is your favorite? Kavite culture and why? That's a great question. Yeah. So for me, it's from garden. It's just the versatility. We use it like, so we do a lot of historic English styles. Uh, it works for all those. It works in dark beers. It works in bitters. Uh, you can kind of fudge it into some German styles as far as like a Kolsch or something like that. Uh, it also plays into the sours. If you wanted to pair it with bacteria, you could do it with like Britannomyces. So it's just a very versatile. It's forgiving. It ferments best, like a little, a little bit lower in temp. So it's like 86, 87 F. So we might pitch a little warmer, but it doesn't necessitate that like nearly a hundred degree temperature. Uh, it looks like Steve Hillert's F R A M. There you go. Thanks, Sharky boy. <laughs> All right. Good, good question, Rodrigo. Oh, uh, looks like our next one that's most popular. Ah, oh, here we go. Uh, Joseph has it. Uh, how many generations will you use the same strain and when does it lose viability? I don't necessarily, I don't know the answer to the last part. <laughs> we haven't necessarily hit that. Uh, we just keep building and building and what we might do now, mind you, we're in like four or five generation per barrel, but then we dump it out, all trub, everything, turn it back over and fill it up. So there's very little, but we've found very little issue at all with the multi-generational thing, but we're using very minimal amounts of those pitches. Now, that being said, whenever I was in the Kavik World Order, like whenever I was, you know, shipping out all around the world, uh, I was building up like two liter starters, saving one tube off of each one of those batches, repitching that into the next two liter to send out another run of them. And I probably did seven or eight generations and still I'd never really had any issue per se. So it, so it sounds like that, Historically, it's not a problem to reuse it over and over again, and you've not seen an issue using it over and over and over again. Correct. Yeah, I mean, wow. you got to figure they were on typically one farm for 100, 200, 300 years. But uh, it's so, so counterintuitive. Only, like, in my opinion, only for the last 100 years. Like, basically, when we really started documenting it and really just spreading it, yes. But outside of that, you have to figure if you were in England, say 1700s, there wasn't isolation. Uh, I'm going to assume that they just repitched from one to the next and they had to keep going. So I, I think if anything, the 20th century changed beer more than beer was in any other century or before. But I mean, that's essentially why past year pursued what he pursued, right? Because the reuse of the yeast was giving lousy beer. Well, and spoilage. And, spoilage. and, and apparently he didn't like Lambic. <laughs> okay. I'd never thought of that, but I, but I got it. <laughs> All right. Our next question comes from Ernie. Ernie says, I want to rehydrate my Kvike. I can't wait to hear this answer because I've tried it once. After I recover Kvike yeast from my fermenter, should I worry about having trube with the dehydrated yeast? I can't wait to hear this answer. So I would rinse it. Uh, distilled water, some kind of purified sterile water. Rinse it two or three times. Uh, allow it to compact and spread that slurry. Uh, the less particulate that is not yeast in there, not Kvike, I think you're going to end up better. Because I think... Whenever they were in Norway and they would dip the ring or they would dip the log into it, 
it was in the top during while the Krausen was there. And so they were getting pure yeast for the most part. And I think that whenever you're messing with the density of the slurry, there's a potential for a, a lower viability. Well, I thought everybody would want to kind of see what, what's going on. Uh, probably because I moved it, it seems to have slowed a little bit. Uh, there's some really large bubbles uh, down in the bottom of it. I will try and maybe use the overhead camera. But uh, uh, Jason had asked in the, uh, in the chat there that he had not tried Lalaman's uh, dried Kavaik yeast. And Jason, I don't know if you caught this from the beginning, uh, but this fermentation that I've got going on here in, in the bottle was started at the beginning of this program. Uh, so it started actually airlock activity within 20 minutes and we've kind of been watching it. And this is Lalaman's uh, Kvike, uh yeast, Voss. Yeah, the beautiful thing that whenever I first got the uh, different Kvike about three and a half years ago now. Uh, um, I kind of looked at it as a way to revolutionize the brewing industry in warmer climates. So if you look around the Gulf, if you're in the U.S., if you're outside the U.S., imagine if you're in like, I don't know, uh, Israel or uh, a, a very warm climate kind of along the uh, equator. If you're in an island, you're Costa Rica, uh, Australia, not having the necessity of glycol or anything to hold your temp down and you can pitch it a hundred, allow it to go and you get clean fermentation. I think it has a potential to revolutionize beer around the world just because it, it can do so many things and so many styles it, without all the extra. It's like Australian football. If you're in if you're in the US, it's all pads, helmets. You go to Aussie, they're jumping on each other's shoulders, it bare essentials, and they're playing the game. But I uh, I was talking to Erin Glass uh, from Lalamond. Mm -hmm. She said she had done one and not used a temperature belt, a fermentation warming belt. So it was only in the mid 70s. And she said it she thought it was never gonna ferment. So she did another batch with a uh, fermentation belt to warm up the uh, fermenter. And I don't know that she told me maybe 88, 90 degrees. And she said, you know, it just knocked it out. So it's one of those things you can ferment too cold. And it is, it sounds like it's a serious problem. Uh, and different ones do differently. Like Scara has a 60 degree temp in the Fahrenheit range, a 60 degree range of fermentation. Now it'll slow on the low end. But Justin, I know, and I think uh, Richard, I think he tested it too. But Scara is the one that has the widest range, to my knowledge. Uh, we found that From Garden stops at about 64. So you can ferment warmer very quickly. In the 70s, it'll finish, but it takes a while. At about 64, it'll literally stop. Then, like we literally have brought in in the winter, it's cold around here sometimes. So we'll put a space heater against it and it'll kick back in. No problem. Wow. What an amazing yeast. <laughs> Good question, Ernie. I'm going to scroll through these right quick, but it looks like we're getting the top questions. So Peter Simons from Down Under uh, from Sydney. Hey, Peter. Uh, I have used Yeast Bay Voss whole package at 25 degrees C for a 1040 golden ale. And after two days, applied pressure up to 15 PSI. This pressure change seemed to affect the yeast, and I ended up with a higher final gravity than expected. Any tips for fermenting Voss under pressure? Um, I don't know if I would do it under pressure. Uh, mostly, and I, I haven't seen a lot of data on it, but as far as uh, traditionally, they were fermented without pressure. You know, they were in open, an open vessel of some kind. Uh, a lot of them I've seen have been like a dairy, can, like a dairy tank, and they would put a lid on it, but it wasn't tight. It was just like a sliding lid, and then put a blanket over it. That was a common thing. So I think that because we don't really like so so 
we'll have some headspace. We'll have a bubbler on our barrels, but at the same time, I, there's no pressure. It's not building up. But it sounds like a tall tank could be a problem also. I mean, 15 PSI is not that much compared to, uh, you know, a tall fermenter. Yeah. And so see, we a, don't do it. All ours are squat and wide. Okay. So if you've got a 15 or 20 foot high fermenter, it sounds like that could be a real problem. It might be. So I know buried acorn in New York, he's a 40 barrel system and he uses a lot of Voss. I've sent him some stuff a couple of years ago and he brews a vast majority of his stuff with Kvike. Okay. So in, any idea what's going on there? I don't, that would be okay. a Richard question. Okay. A, a Richard priest. Yes. All right. Peter, you know who to ask, but I may ask him too. <laughs> uh, all right. Tom's got our next question. And when using Kvike that is fermented at higher temperatures, like 85, <clears throat> excuse me, does it need to be incremented two degrees F each day when the primary fermentation is near completion or completed? So in other words, should you, you know, before you cold crash it, should you do it slowly? I'm probably the wrong person to ask on that. Again, we don't cold crash anything unless it gets cold outside and accidentally cold crash. Uh, yeah, I, that'd be something. There's a uh, Brewing with Kvike Facebook group and then Milk the Funk. Again, they're Wikipedia and it looks like, uh, who was it? Henry Elser uh, yep. asked where the bottle conditioning procedure was documented. So that's on the Milk the Funk wiki page and also a ton of other information. So they have a large Kvike section. They have bottle conditioning. They have a lot of stuff. Okay. Now I've only brewed two Kvikes in very mm -hmm. small quantities, but I cold crashed them both. Why do you not? I mean, I just, I did it out of habit. Oh, I, I can't say not to. I'm just saying we don't. Okay. We don't just because again, my business model was to be 200 years ago. Okay. Like as far as our brewing procedures, that's why we're yeah. doing things like Kudu Ulu or Kep Tennis or Breslau Schups. Essentially, a lot of our stuff is based around styles that don't exist. But but as far as you know, there's not a reason to cold crash it. And and what I did is I went from 100, 105 degrees down to 38 in probably 12 hours. I mean, is, is there anything wrong with that? Fine. I mean, if it's if it's a terminal from at fermentation, I don't see why you couldn't just crash it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sharky boy has this one. Uh, does bottom or top cropping for Kvike culture, uh, in the case of bottom slash top cropping, that was suggested for that particular strain or or is unable to proceed? Does it really matter? So bottom I've had, top cropping. I've had a couple that said bottom that I've done on top. And I've had a couple that have said top that I've done on the bottom. Uh, it does seem like there's a touch of viability issue, but I could say that it also worked every time. So I don't think it's a, uh, is like hard written in stone. I think that's more of a, what's traditionally done. And probably there's a certain point where it's most viable. And it uh, well, looks like, I wanted to look over here in the chat. It looks like uh, Tom said for a diacetyl rest, the funny thing, I've never in any batch of Kvike had a diacetyl issue. Well, and, and that was my experience too on the two batches that I did. I, I did a diacetyl check and they were kind of like not even close. And, and I think I checked them at 36 hours. Mm -hmm. So yes, phenomenal. I wanted to switch back to the beers for just a minute <clears throat> and uh, they are so pretty. And I, and I just wanted to let you know which one I, I really like the piquet, the one here in the center. <clears throat> That's just a delicious, smooth wine like beer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. That is so nice. That is just a delicious beer and how pretty. I mean, it's just, just a gorgeous beer. Like I said, we try to use a lot of old world techniques, old world styles, but they're, they're built. And I mean, that's like the prop behind you. 
the the setting and yeah that's basically i uh, so much of what i want is built around kind of like jack Ger jack kerouac going through europe and just so, an eclectic easy drinking kind of public hiccups so so explain this uh for for those this this is a green screen uh since uh, we're stuck home I'm having fun with this. And so can you explain what we're, where I am? So, so to speak virtually. Yeah. So if you walk into ebb, that is the room just to the left. You'd go up a couple steps, you turn to your left and we call that the grotto. Uh, basically it's just a collection of, of different. Yeah. That actually shows you well. Uh, it's just a, a spot where people can hang out. Uh, the wall, if you were looking at it, where you're at, my dad was in Germany and that's actually where I kind of got my love of beer. Uh, he was in a uh, in the military and there's a photo on the wall of him at a beer bar in Germany. And so we did talked about beer a lot as a kid and that's where a lot of this came from. And so there's parts of that that I bought, but there's a lot of that that's from me. And so it's, I've had a lot of my friends who haven't been there that are saying that that's what that's it feels dad, like. Right? Pardon? That's not your dad, right? No, no. If you were standing there, no. I mean, Looks I, like I my hips like that, but. <laughs> <laughs> but no, oh, uh, it, it's a fun little area. Okay. Uh, we, we, we digress. Uh, so I think you got Sharky Boy's question in there. Uh, so Phil has the next one. Which Kvike strains are best for brewing a New England IPA? I I know Horn and Dahl is used a lot. I've had some really good ones. I've actually had a fair amount of really bad ones. Um, I know Maniacal on the small level, they have them. They have a couple different blends that he builds. I think Juggernaut's one of them. Uh, he doesn't do a ton especially right now, I think his lab's down with COVID. So he'll probably, you know, build back up and have another offering offerings and check. I'm like, subscribe to his list. And whenever he has a sale, he'll put them up. Uh, outside of that, Voss works. Voss works real well. You get a citrus note. I, I think the biggest thing with so many of them is be a little delicate or more delicate than you would traditionally with your IPAs as far as the hopping. I think you get kind of weird flavor combinations sometimes. I think there's a couple that have bio transformation that's a little weird. So ease into it. Maybe start with a session IPA or like a session IPA and then work up after that. Have you actually experienced that? As far as what, the bitterness in the bio yeah, transformation? Yeah, the bio transformation. A little bit, yeah. Uh, the biggest thing we found with Kavike, because we've made a number of NEPA, they just, there, there's a bitterness and there's a rawness to them that we don't get whenever we're dealing with some of the English cheese. So I'm not sure what it is. Okay. Uh, because I did an IPA with my very first one was an IPA and it was Voss. Uh, it was, it was actually Lalamans and I thought it was very nice. It, it brought a little bit of that orangey characteristic to it and it was a new England IPA. Was so it like the dry nice. dry and again, I did very small quantities of hops. Uh, no, no, small quad, small batch brew. Maybe it was just a gallon and a half. What was the uh, hopping? Was it like a, a really heavy dosing late or was it just like a moderate NEPA? Yeah, just moderate. And I think that's where it does its best. You know, when okay. you start doing the heavy, heavy hopping, that's where I get a lot more of the issue. Dry hopping, heavy dry hopping? Yes. Okay, I did not dry hop this at all. Okay, it that's probably a lot of them. Whirlpool. So yeah, that, I found the pardon. Dry hopping is really maybe where that uh, biotransformation is occurring. Yeah, and I think that's where some of the. This isn't always just biotransformation that I'm talking about. There's a bitterness that I found that's kind of weird with a lot of the uh, Kvike strains, true. Okay, so you so you're a little unsure whether it actually is dry hopping or correct related. Or okay. All right, now. You said Levi might know that Levi Fried. Yeah, he does a lot. Okay, all right. So, so just to kind of pursue the question a little bit more, uh, Phil, I am talking to Levi, 
and he's going to do a program. We're going to find out more this week and we'll set a date, uh, but he'll be the one maybe to give us a really good answer there. So we will move on. Uh, Keith has our next question. Just asking if anyone is interested in using Kvike more within the North Norwegian for farmhouse tradition. Cornol, uh, is that how I pronounce Cornel. that? All right. So timed because of Lars' 400 page mag magnum opus will be out in a few days. Also, my friend from Stavanger insists that locally it is pronounced Vike, although there is a tendency to pronounce the K in the South. Yeah. So there's, it's Quike or Kvike or I've heard Wike. There, it depends apparently which little village you're in. There's different dialects. Uh, I you hope. Can't do it wrong. More, pardon? You can't say it wrong. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I say it wrong every day. I just, no, I mean, you can't say it wrong. Oh, uh, depends on which village you're in. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I hope that these Norwegian styles take off. Uh, we've done Cornell a couple times at the brewery. We've done Stortelsul, which again, we've used uh, Sugar Creek. He's got a uh, Norwegian style sign house. So he's actually doing Alderwood smoked malts that are very similar to and done traditionally like they would in Norway. And it's a smoked malt beard. I, I would have sent one, but we literally sold out of them like the week before. But, but along the same line, now I followed Laura's recipe for the one I brewed. Mm -hmm. It had no boil. Are you Correct. doing no boils? Some of them. It depends on which village. So like Voss typically has a boil. Uh, Stortel, it can have a boil. Sometimes it doesn't. If you do, I'm trying to think which villages. Like Hornendal is mostly no boil. They're the Rahuls. Okay. And so, so does do that always turn out cloudy? I mean, mine did, and I, yeah. I guess you would have to. No, it, with a little bit of time. So it's funny. We've actually had raws that have we've aged six months, and they get clear. They're not sour. They're it. I think it, different ones are di just different. I don't know what it is. Okay. Uh, and what about the juniper branches? You so know, we, I, did, we did Juniperus virginiana, a.k.a. Uh, Eastern Red Cedar. So okay. that there you can use. It, if it, There's a, the toy pen said poisonous whenever I was a kid, but it's not. The, the levels are low enough whenever you're just doing this. And I know that, I know that only because like Scratch has used them, uh, Fauna Flora has used them. So they are passable through the FDA in this level. I don't think you want to eat the branches. Red but when you're cedar doing an infusion of tea, it's fine. Uh, and I think it's it's pretty. We try to do them as most of Norway does them with no berries. Well, that was my next question. So is there a time of year when you should get the red, red, red cedar? I don't know if I'd say a time of year. I prefer the smaller trees. So I like them when the... Um, I don't know what you call them, the, not leaves, but whatever. I'd like them when they're prickly, not scaly. So when they get to be, they're like 20, 30 feet tall and they're very scaly. I don't think they work as well. So they're, they're really pungent. I think the oil's just uh, aggressive when they're young and they're really prickly. That's oh, yeah. whenever I think that they're closest to Juniperus conimus, which I've actually used. I had a guy send me down some from uh, New Brunswick. So no berries, though. So you said Correct. you avoid the berries. Yes. Is there a reason? Uh, you don't. You're not making gin or sadi. Oh, oh, it would convey. Oh, all right. Yeah, Get you're you're getting away gel. from a woody, citrusy note more to like a gin note. Ah, another reason not to use juniper berries in lieu of it. Correct. Yeah, the, it's totally different. Totally different. Okay. Well, I, I decided I wasn't going to risk it, even though a lot of people encouraged me to. They, they said, you can always try it once. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Joseph in the chat, he said, rinse. Uh, yeah, you always want to rinse your, your uh, branches. You can get a number of different things on them. Yeah, I, I know Lars had talked about the bugs. Well, yeah. and, and Joseph mentions the mold. Mm -hmm. uh, and Joseph, maybe you can comment what you would rinse it with. I mean, we just talking soap and water or anything different. Yeah. And I would just, we just do water. 
Just water. Just yeah, spray and we it look off. over them. Just make sure there's nothing weird on them. N no soap? No. Okay. Would you avoid soap? Probably. I don't know if you're getting it in there. I don't know if you want those compounds in it. Yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering, but it seems like it might take soap to get off mold. So Steve asks, are there companies that ship fresh juniper? That's a really good question. I wish. Find a friend in New Brunswick. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Joseph says just straight water. Okay. Yeah. Keith, that was a great question. These are such good questions. I love this. Steve has the next one. Uh, Omega Hothead is derived from Strata Kvike. Correct. According to Lars, Strata should be pitched at half a teaspoon for a five-gallon batch. Is that considered underpitching? I mean, sure. And whenever you're getting, I, I haven't played with a a uh, package of hothead in a long time. I think when it first came out, I got one and played with it. Whenever you're doing a teaspoon, they're not talking about, about a teaspoon of a package. They're talking about a teaspoon of pure slurry. So, I mean, it's sludge. So if you're doing that, you're probably like a half pack would probably do it. Uh, a half pack, a sachet. Yes. Yeah, so of the, yeah, of the uh, hothead because well, it it's not dried. So that's the lollipop. Oh, yeah. That's right. He's talking about the liquid. And yeah. the fun thing with those, so Stronda is one of the very few Kavik that the commercial in the original cultures are the same. Okay. The when they brought that up, only one from dried, only one culture was in there. Only one yeast strain. Most every other one has a multiple, you know, whether it be bacteria or yeast or whatever it is. But Stronda was only one. So whenever you're getting hothead, you're getting Stronda. Okay. And, and going back to our previous question, Paul says some florists can provide fresh juniper. And Joseph mentions you can rinse several times with water, sort of like doing collards. Yes, I would agree on the collards. I would be cautious on the florist. Most of those have probably been sprayed and the thing you want to make sure is that it's Juniperus communis. There's a number of ornamental juniper that are actually toxic. Oh, so you better pick it yourself is what I hear. Make sure you know what it is. Yeah, and Henry says, uh, just make sure you get the bird poop off the yeast ring. <laughs> <laughs> That's why hopefully the birds aren't getting into my barrels. <laughs> if so, I got a problem. Uh, all right. Uh, Joseph has the next question. How many generations would you use the same strain? I think we've sort of answered this, but I bet it's a quick answer. Yeah. I'm, right now, I can't say a top end. I mean, I, I we're going at least five, six. I'm going to assume it, as long as you're kind of treating it nicely, not doing too many hops, which we're not doing, not doing too high of an alcohol, you can probably just keep going almost indefinitely. You know, um, pull some out, especially if you're doing it as far as like in a bucket and harvesting or a carboy, uh, just save it, rinse it, dry it. And from what I understand, the drying is actually sort of a purification process. So by drying, if there's any form of contamination, most of them can't desiccate the way that Kavite can. So the drying purifies any of the other wildness out. So Lars mentioned, you know, that their beers are pretty high in alcohol. So where is that line of too much alcohol that you wouldn't reuse the yeast over and over again? Am, am I remembering so. right? I thought he threw out like 13%. The, so one of the things I'd like to see, because most of the time Lars, from what I gather, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, isn't taking a final reading. They're taking a, a reading before they ferment. Yep. I'd be curious what the final numbers are though. I know they can ferment high as far as like high gravities, but I've read a lot of tasting notes and it sounds like they're sweeter than a lot of what we're fermenting to. So I don't okay. know if the grab or I don't know if the alcohol is actually as high as what the original Thank gravity you. is telling us. Yeah. So now everything I've brewed and everything I've tasted of yours mm -hmm. is very dry. Yes. So why would the Norwegian 
fermentations not be equally dry? Because they're pulling it three days. It seems like it ferments that quick. Some of them. I mean, again, you have to have it that hot. So if you're fermenting in oh, the winter and they're keeping uh, it as warm and it's done. Yep. And yep. then they're putting it into the plastic bottles. It may not be done. Going back and like there's a. Um, but, because it, they don't use control temperatures in their fermentation, Correct. right? Correct. Okay. So just like Erin mentioned doing hers and she didn't get it warm enough and it stalled out and they really couldn't get it restarted. Okay. That and makes if you sense. Read, if you read through some of his blog and in the book, he mentions he might be at someone's house brewing and they'll say, oh, this didn't ferment as far. It's not as sweet how many people may have that have happened to, and they just didn't mention. Yeah. Well, and Phil says also they're mashing at 168 to 176. Yeah. The one I did following Lars recipe was at 165, I think. Yeah. And we're typically mashing around like 155, 158. Yeah. It finished at about 10, 16, 10, 17, if I remember right. But uh, one of the things I, I'm a dry beer junkie. So yeah, and you can tell it in our beers. But but it was really good. Uh, you know, it was the first, I guess, raw beer I've ever had. And so uh, the balance was really interesting. Very, very, a different sort of maltiness. Yeah, the, the textures are different. Okay, Joseph says his answer, his question's already been answered, but I think it was good enough. I want to touch on it. You can just give a quick answer. Okay. I played with three Kavaiki styles on average, and the ABVs were 5 to 6%. Does higher alcohol levels like 10% affect the yeast esters or phenolics? I would say that it probably does affect the esters. As a whole, I wouldn't say there's much phenolic you're going to get. Uh, Miri, which isn't actually in the Kavike family tree, that has phenolics. And then uh, the Lithuanians like Yarafu, or semenitis, those are a different family as well. And those are phenolic. So you're basically looking at ester profiles. I think that whenever you're playing with that, you do get more esters with larger beers probably. But I think the biggest, the biggest factor is how soon you drink it. The, so if you get it, you ferment it fast, you, you package it quickly, your, your esters are huge. As they, as they age, that falls off and they get really clean, which is why I think of a lot of a lot of the lagers. It's easier to do than what you would think because the esters seem to diminish quicker. Oh, okay. I, kn I knew there was more to that question. All right. Bill has the next question. You mentioned the Oslo strain for lager like beer. Will it drop clear quickly? Any need for diacetyl rest? I don't, I would say probably not on diacetyl. And as far as, again, the dropping quick, that's something I know Levi uses Oslo a lot. So he would give a really good answer. But like I said, this to my knowledge is Oslo. It's clear. I'm assuming that they're just doing like a week long, you know, cold, uh, cold conditioning and go from there. So I guess it depends on what your definition of it is of quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. if lagering is two or three months, what if you want a uh, you know a fox log a logger? How long do you think it would be to clear up? You're, you're just drinking one that's relatively clear. Correct. I'm going to assume theirs is fairly quick. Again, from the sounds of what I think Levi, I, I think a couple weeks. Okay. Okay. So so, so a tenth the time of a normal probably, logger. but it so at the uh, at the brewery at Ebb, I have a harder issue since I don't cold crash before I condition it takes longer. And I don't know why, but we're looking like two and a half months to really clear up. Okay. But you think if you cold crashed it, uh, it might yeah, go quicker. It, it probably would. Cause we're packaging straight out of barrel into kegs and then chilling them. And you said, even if it was a raw beer. Yes. I've got to try that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. I've got to try it. Mine did not clear up. Raw New England's are fun. That's actually where we've had our best success. But but I will have to admit, on my first raw beer, I screwed up when I was transferring it, 
and I sprayed most of it on the ceiling uh, by accident. So <laughs> my my uh, brew house has a whole new aroma. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wasn't laughing at the time. Uh, okay. Peter says, what was the strain you mentioned giving the Fuller's like flavor? From garden. Can and you I saw that? Cause I don't know that I know it. F R A M G E G A R D E N. And I saw oh, it in the like chat. Someone, let me see. It looked like, Look like the yeast bay has uh, has that. And I don't know if that's full culture or not, but apparently they have some of the culture for sale through the yeast bay. Okay, Sharky Boy says uh, more like Fram Garden. F R A M G A R D E N. Maybe I, from what I've heard from my from my Norwegian buddies, it's more of a Fram. Okay, okay, but but regardless, we ought to get close yes. if we want it. So who has? It, you know, if I wanted to brew that or Peter wanted to brew it and he's down in Sydney, Australia, where would he get that? I don't know who all goes down there. Like I said, right now, to my knowledge, in the U.S., you can get it through Yeast Bay and you can get it through Maniacal. OK. OK. All right. Steve's got the next question. How long can an open package, but sealed in a jar of liquid Kvike sit in the refrigerator, i.e. hothead? So you have a package, you've opened it, you've put it in a jar. That's the way the question reads. So I, I, I've never done that. So I can't give an exact on that. I can say that I've revived three year old tubes of Kvike just like you would normally pitch a regular starter. So it's pretty forgiving is what I hear. It's ridiculously forget, forgiving. Ridiculously forgiving. <laughs> I actually, so there's a William Holden. He passed away last year, but he was the guy who organized the uh, Kvike Fest in Norway. He sent over a strain called Volsather. He brew some and I grew some in, uh, from the dried and it was over 30 years in a freezer. Oh my gosh. And it came wow. up. Great question, Steve. Michael has the next one. Uh, how have the Kvike beers that you've canned responded to packaging time and age? Again, we do the Bob Sylvester method, method and uh, we've had horrible, when we first started trying to can condition with just Kvike, it was miserable. Uh, you know, I think that's part of the pressure. So we can condition with uh, champagne yeast following that method, and it works perfectly. So how many months would you give a beer? Uh, let's say, uh, well, is that what you're asking as far as like a, can, so yeah, that was ready to go in three weeks. How, how long could I keep it? Oh, that beer will hold. Traffic. We brewed that in September. But it's not particularly high in alcohol, right? No, that's about five and a half. Five and a half. Mm -hmm. So so it's Kvike fermented. How long could I keep it? I'd say about a year on that one. Most of ours, uh, probably wow. six to eight months. And it's bottle conditioned, so there mm -hmm. should be almost no oxygen in it. Correct. I love it. Okay. So... So would you say Kvike, well, let's see, I guess, I guess the Kvike is gone by the time it's bottle conditioned is, is, I mean, are the, cause you rack it, I don't it's know, all so gone then you put in champagne yeast. Yeah. I don't know if it's gone per se. I just, we let the champagne take over. I, I'll look at it like this. We have a party, all the Kvikes there. Kvike had a little too much to drink. Chauffeur comes in and he's going to take it to the other party. And that's what champagne is. Champagne <laughs> use is, is the chauffeur. Okay. <laughs> but at that point, I mean, can you bottle condition with Kvike? Is, this is, is that, we've had four results with that. So that is probably the key question or key answer to this. Yeah. Whatever you do, don't bottle condition with Kvike. I, I wouldn't recommend it. We've had poor results in trying it. In any idea why? I think part of it is... Part of it is probably the pressure. Right. Cause that's, that's what Peter was talking about. 
Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, Gary's got our next question. What failures have you had other than IPA styles or outcomes with, uh, with Kavike? So we, we've only talked about your good stories. What are, what are the sad ones? Uh, we had seven barrels of one that got cold and we couldn't warm it up and dumped it. <laughs> yeah, okay. it was cold, cold. It was during our first spring season. Thought the thermal mass would keep it going. And it, it basically, our brewing room got to about 42 degrees. So it doesn't revive well, is what I hear. Uh, it can, but when you're trying to bring 700 some odd gallons up with space heaters, it doesn't, it just wasn't enough. Okay. Okay. But, but apparently I, I guess the, I think there's a little bit of a pattern amongst us that it doesn't revive well. If it ever slows for some period of time, it's apparently hard to, to revive it and restore it. In the homebrew level, I don't think it's too bad. Like yeah. you can put a space heater up against it. And I think for the most part, we've had that happen. You know, some of our like little homebrew batches we were playing with before we opened, it would get cold and we'd put a space heater and it looked like it was done. And then it'd crank up and be done in a couple of days. But like when we're dealing with massive amounts, it was hard. Okay. Well, we have nine minutes to go and looks like we have nine questions. So we're going to have to do these rapid fire. Power round. All right. So John asks, is there any way I can get folk art beers in Washington state? I'm hoping so. Uh, right now we're working with our state, like our state government and trying to get it to where Missouri can ship outside. That's literally something that uh, myself and uh, one of my other Bruin buddies is trying to do. And our uh, the guild in Missouri sent a lot of legislation to the government and the number of officials. So if that passes, yes. Okay. Uh, our next one, and I'm going to get the, uh, the, the award to show right quick uh, while you're answering this one. So the question is, how do you get enough oxygen in the wort at higher pitch temperatures? With the barrel fer fermentation, do you aim for oxygen fermentation from the wood during ferment fermentation? There is some from the wood is what we've noticed. Uh, we don't oxygenate much, but we do a very rustic style we're pushing it through really hard through the chiller. And uh, we've just found whenever we're putting it in that hot and with the yeast being acc acclimated to the barrels, it works really well. But from what I gather, a lot of other people, the oxygen, and then again, my buddy, um, Tim Shore, he actually was doing some spent yeast as nutrient. So essentially like he would collect yeast and he and you know 40 barrels would throw something like two quarts of spent yeast and use that as a uh, as a nutrient and he said it a saves him lots of money but b works very well all right and as you can see our fermentation is clocking right along it's probably almost done yeah <laughs> actually that's that's been my experience <laughs> a couple more hours and it will be done all right uh Merlinia says the next question by decoction, do you mean the full boiling of one third of it and then adding it? Or is it just one decoction? We can, we definitely do one. We like to do a couple. So my brewer gets uh, huffy on these days. He likes it. He loves the, the, what it does to the style, but it's, it's a lot of work. All right. So, but I'm, I'm not sure I heard your answer. Is it, one decoction or several? It depends on the beer. We've Do done some. With, pardon? Do you taste it? Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, we'll do, it just depends on what we're looking for. So if we're wanting a lighter, like when on a rice lager, we'll yeah. do a single. But if we're wanting like a Vienna style, we'll do two or three actually. Okay. Okay. To, to the degree you want those decoction flavors. Exactly. All right. I'm slowing things down. We got a couple more questions. Uh, Ed asked this one for barrel fermentation. Are you repitching the yeast at all? And how many generations are you seeing in the barrel pitches? So right now we're at five generations on most of them. And really once we get it in there, we don't repitch at all. 
All right, I'm gonna try and straighten that up because it's driving me crazy. <laughs> there we go. I hope that's a little better. <laughs> we'll blame the so bottle. Guys really going to town here though. All right, a little over six minutes left. We have seven questions. Uh, Keith asked the next one, do you recommend any changes to recipe for Kvike lagers, changes to lagering schedule? I wouldn't say changes to the lagering schedule. And like I said, I would just try to keep the recipe as true to what it would originally be. You know, if you're using a, a German yeast, um, like a, a true lager yeast, the only thing you may do, look at a Scartman's blog and he has a, basically a piece on pH. Some of the Kvaik will drop pH more than most other yeast. So you might adjust your pH up a touch. Pre-boil. All right. Phil's got the next one. Anyone know where I can get dried Kvaik? And Phil, I can begin to answer that one. Uh, Lalamon's got it. Uh, that's what we're doing today. Why well, about you? Do you know of any others? I know Main Iacol has, whenever he has them, he does dries. Okay. Are they flakes? They're the, they're the flakes. They're the old school Norwegian style flakes. From Maniacal. Okay. Probably probably need to get him on the show. I, I could probably talk to him. <laughs> Good. Uh, Jim says, have you tried Omega's Hothead? So I think you've answered that. Yeah, it's been quite a while since I've had, uh, but yes, I have. And I, it's it's a fun one. It For the styles we do, Stronda isn't our favorite. I don't dislike it. It's just I like whenever you have, you know, 20 some odd options, it's, you know, in the middle of the bunch. All right. We're going to have an unceremonious ending. So I'm, we're going to do these real quick. Dwayne, how did your kept us? Kept his turnout. Uh, the kept tennis turned out really well. Um, if people want to go to like Kavik World Order and ask on there if they want like a long description of how we do it, I can talk about it. But yeah, I really enjoyed them. It's kind of a weird between a Belgian duple and uh, light, like a brown porter. Okay, but I pronounced it wrong. It's kept tennis. Kept tennis. Is, that's how I understand kept it. Tennis. Kept tennis. Okay. Yeah, you bake the mash. Steve asks, what would be a good beginner's beer, wine, Kvike recipe? 70% um, blonde wort. If you can get grapes, crush them, just hand crush them, take your Kvike, pitch it in. I don't like Candom tab tablets. I like just the natural yeast if, if they haven't been sprayed and let them go. Maybe, you know, five to 10 IBUs if you want to keep the pH a little higher and just let her go. I mean, it took me a couple of years of just playing around trial and error to get to where I was comfortable with it. Okay. About 90 seconds left, but Michael says, thank you, Dwayne, for putting this on. This was excellent. Gary's thank got you. the next one. Your beers are not even available in Arkansas. No, right now they're pretty much only at the brewery. Okay. That's sad. And Francisco has our very last one, and it looks like we've got maybe 90 seconds. Should I worry about Kvike culture that might have some bacteria and infect my fermenter? Uh, I would say if it's a plastic fermenter or okay. a plastic part. So, I mean, if you do, if you're doing stainless or glass for years, I would kind of cohabitate at home. And as long as you're porous, like your porous parts, like the plastics, I would have a dirty batch and a clean batch, you know, okay. as far as my equipment. Lots of thank yous coming in the chat. I'm not going to read them so we can just finish up right quick. Uh, just to let you know, Friday at, at 730 Eastern, I'm going to be doing an event in conjunction with Beer Connoisseur Beer Club. I will send out info on that. Uh, could include Richard DeBay of Braxton's Labs, but will also include Drecker and Rheingeist's uh, Brewery. We're also working on another Kvike live stream with Levi Fried, and I'm going to be sharing my Siebel journey. So more coming on that. We've got about 40 seconds left. Do you want to just say something right quick before we have a hard ending? Uh, again, if anyone wants any more information, um, you can check Ebb and Flow Fermentations. Uh, that's the brewery. 
You could do Kvyk World Order. Uh, if you want more information, Milk the Funk, Brewing with Kvyk on Facebook. Uh, Kvyk and Gruit, there's a Facebook group that I started called the Gruit Guild. There's a lot of great information out there. And I think it's just a fun yeast to play with. Thank you, everybody. We got 10 seconds, four seconds, but I appreciate your time.